So today we're continuing our study in this book, uh, The Infallible Word, uh, the text from the professors of Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia, published back in 1946, uh, on um, the authority of Scripture, a great uh, important topic in our world today. We made our way through uh, the general idea of the self-attestation of Scripture under John Murray and uh, his uh, analysis of Scripture testifying to its own unique authority as the Word of God. Um, then we've gone through the uh, Old Testament and the authority of the Old Testament with Dr. Edward J. Young. He's taken us through uh, the testimony of the Old Testament to itself with the repeated claims, thus saith the Lord, to use the old King James language. Um, so this, uh, along with uh, the uh, uh, various prophecies and, and fulfillments and the miracles performed, uh, testify to its uh, authority as the Word of God. Uh, next, we went into a consideration of the New Testament with Dr. Um, Ned Stonehouse, and uh, we saw how the New Testament likewise testifies to the fact that it is the Word of God, uh, fully authoritative on the same level as the Old Testament, uh, equal to the Old Testament in authority as the Word of God. That finally brings us to what we're, we've been considering over the last few weeks and perhaps a couple of months now, uh, the transmission of the scriptures by Dr. Uh, John Skilton. And this transmission of the scriptures considers how the original text of scripture has been passed down to us over the centuries and how uh, through the copies of the Greek manuscripts and then the translations of the original Greek manuscripts into different languages like Latin and eventually English and German and so forth. Uh, you have back in the, the older time the, the Syriac version uh, uh, and a number of others. Um, these translations uh, are also used as evidence for what is uh, the original text of Scripture. So you got copies of the Greek manuscripts, translations into different languages, you have collections of manuscripts or collections, excuse me, of uh, texts in uh, lectionaries, which are uh, readings for Sunday worship services in the churches of the time. And so there'll be these collections of scripture, not you know, seriatically or chronologically through the Bible, but uh, topically along the way. Um, but you would have those kinds of documents in the early history of the church that you could refer to. Uh, you have sermons, uh, theological treaties, uh, books, written, which quote from the Greek or uh, maybe the Latin, or what have you. And, and so you have those witnesses as well, which uh, provide a, a sense of uh, history, uh, a location and time and place for different texts of Scripture. And so uh, we've made the point that there is a, a, a considerable abundance of testimony to the uh, revelation of God given in the New Testament in the original manuscripts. We believe that the original manuscripts uh, written by the apostles and prophets were inspired word of God. They were inerrant in all that they had to say, whether it's of religious matters or matters of history, geography, time, place, what have you. Everything that scriptures affirm is the word of God and uh, can be trusted. So the, the original documents are word of God, but then the copies coming after that, we believe, contain the word of God. They are essentially pure in the sense that all the uh, doctrines and the uh, prescriptions for life given in Scripture continue with us today in the manuscript copies that we have with us today. There's nothing lost from the original manuscripts into what we have today. The original manuscripts is present in the abundance of the texts 
that we have today, but no one particular text is identical with the original uh, text of, of Scripture. Uh, the, the copies have, uh, if you will, mistakes in them, variant readings, uh, mistakes by the copyists, whether they're reading from one line and then skipping their eye to the next and, and missing a whole line of text or inverting words or uh, thinking something's left out here and putting something in the margin to explain that. And then somebody later on sees the, the marginal note and doesn't understand that it's just simply a marginal note and he incorporates it into his next copy of the text. So the, the, these kinds of things happen. And what tends to happen is that over time, the, the, the copies begin to get larger and larger. They take on weight, kind of like we do as we age. Um, there, there are added readings to the text. And so the text uh, expands over time because um, there is first the, the incentive not to take anything away from the original text uh, as godly Christian copyists had the text before them. They wanted to make sure as best they could that they copied it faithfully. But at the same time, there are things which were difficult to understand. And I thought, well, there, there's some kind of a mistake perhaps in the copy that I have here, and I'll correct that on my own. And, and then things begin to expand. And we talked about how uh, in our current New Testament, uh, for example, in the King James Version, you have what I think is uh, a translation of one of, the, uh, of these expanded texts, which includes things like the, the story of Jesus and the woman caught in adultery in John chapter 8. Uh, it includes um, the uh, three witnesses of 1 John chapter 5, um, three in heaven, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, that is a, an addition I think, to the text, amplifying some things uh, there. And um, the, the tail end of the Gospel of Mark, after chapter 16, verse 8 and following, uh, that too is uh, an addition to the text, because when you end the Gospel of Mark at the 8th verse of chapter 16, you feel like there's a cliffhanger. Well, where's Jesus? He's risen from the dead, but Mark doesn't tell us he met with Mary, he met with Peter, he met with the disciples in the upper room. He doesn't tell us any of that, just has the announcement that he's risen. And that's how he ends the gospel, that the angels announce that he's risen. And the women are afraid, and, and, and it's kind of a, a wide-open ending that's waiting for something else. And in God's providence, it seems to me, the answer to that is not adding to that, but rather listening to further Revelation in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke and John, who begin to fill out those kinds of things, uh, in part. That, that's, uh, it's like the Gospel of Mark was more than likely the first Gospel written, and then the others come along and begin to expand on that and develop it and add new details. So Mark kind of anticipates others are going to be writing and doing more, and so let's wait for them. In any case, um, you have what seems to me to be the expansion of the Greek text over time as additional readings are brought into the text. You, I think Rick brought up the, a previous time the way in which the names of Christ are uh, amplified and, and, and uh, repeated uh, in the Greek text. So instead of the text saying, he... Uh, for example, Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Uh, some wanted to make that more clear, and they said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Well, it's the same thing, relative pronoun. It goes back, to, points to Christ. No difference in the meaning there. But some wanted to just make sure that's clear, and so they said Christ. Now, it's not a, if you will, a wrong translation in the sense or or copying the, the Greek text is not wrong per se in the sense that it does have the same meaning, but it's wrong in terms of it's not exactly what was originally placed there. And, and similarly, in other texts where you have 
the Lord Jesus Christ rather than Christ or Jesus, you know, just, just the one name or what have you. You have the expansion of the name of Christ to add dignity, nobility. It's kind of like the movie scene of, uh, was it Master, not Master and Commander, um, the scene of, of uh, the, the Roman centurion. He's in, in the Colosseum. He's about to fight uh, all kinds of people. And he happens to be the general of Caesar's army. And he announces his name. My name is Maxus Aurelius, the leader of the uh, king's army. And he goes through this long set of titles as to who he was. And you know, all of a sudden, this, this guy who looks like a slave is actually now seen to be one of the great military leaders of Rome. Uh, so there's this amplification that tends to occur within the text of Scripture. So anyway, uh, what Dr. Skilton has done for us has been to take us through uh, the transmission of the Scriptures. It's being passed down from time to time in history. And... Uh, introduced us to the idea of textual criticism. How it is we look at these various manuscripts and decide between one reading and the next and determine which reading is more likely original and which is a mistake uh, or, or not in, entirely accurate. Uh, and so there is a science that has developed over time with various rules and principles for how we uh, get to the original text based on the, the various copies that we have. And Skilton did say that you know, perhaps if the early church fathers had been more careful and more disciplined in the way that they made those copies, like the uh, Jewish Masoretes and the way that they were very, very careful with regard to the uh, text of the Old Testament with their numerical evaluations and so forth, if the New Testament copyists were quite as uh, consistent as the Old Testament writers, then probably there would be fewer, if you will, errors or variant readings in the New Testament text. And so we could have a more accurate text. But that just happens not to have been the case over time. Um, we've seen that um, people have... The, the copyist would sit in the large room and somebody would be up front reading from the, the main copy and the other writers would be sitting down at their desk writing and they might not have heard what he said correctly. We saw that, I think, in Romans chapter 5 where it's just one letter, O, you know, pronounced it in a short or long form, A ah or O, oh, and the words Ercon uh, and Ercon. Uh, and th this leads to a, a difference in reading in the text just by the, the one replacement of the vowel, um, whether long or short. And so it's either uh, we have peace with God, just a statement, or let us have peace with God, uh, an imperative claim. So um, it's a these details can be examined and evaluated on the basis of the science of textual criticism. And there are a variety of things that come into view there in making those determinations. Um, the the uh, evidence of the text itself and then um, the, the, the uh, context surrounding it and so forth. So I don't have time to get into all the rules and laws of things, but um, the one point that Skelton wanted to make about textual criticism, and, and I would like to highlight here, is that textual criticism is not necessarily hostile to the text of Scripture. We have this idea of criticism as being a skeptical approach to Scripture, uh, and, and oftentimes it's founded on a naturalistic bias that seeks to explain away the elements of the supernatural in Scripture and is hostile to the message of Scripture itself. And so when we first hear the claim of textual criticism, we think it's coming from a position of hostility to the Scriptures. And so we might be rather shy or distrustful for the science of textual criticism. Now, 
that can very well be the case. You can very well have a, a naturalistic approach to the text of Scripture and try to explain away the various aspects of things in the text. So we need to be very much cognizant of that. But at the same time, um, Skilton was at pains to show that textual criticism can come on the foundation of uh, a, a godly belief in the authority of Scripture and a devotion at d discovering what is the original text of Scripture and trying to sort through the variant readings and stuff in order to get exactly what it was that was found in the original text of Scripture. So, again, remember, um, with regard to the text of Scripture, uh, the, the copies and manuscripts, they all have different variant readings. There's no one Greek manuscript that, first of all, exactly matches the original text of Scripture or matches all the other Greek manuscripts. They all have unique differences here and there, even within what is called the traditional text or the majority text or the Byzantine text, the Textus Receptus, that whole uh, collection of texts that uh, many look on as the foundation for the King James Version of the Bible. And, uh, and, and it's been received over history and time through providence, through the illumination of the Spirit and uh, other things as being uh, the authoritative text of the New Testament. And therefore, other uh, families of Greek New Testament texts, which are not a part of that mainstream of texts, are therefore discounted and uh, not considered as authoritative in terms of getting us back to the original text of Scripture. Um, Again, the point I made last time was that no matter what position you take, that of the traditional text or the modern critical approach, which takes all text available into consideration, good or not so good, takes them all into consideration, um, one way or the other, you have to make certain decisions about what Greek text are you going to follow. Erasmus had five different manuscripts in front of him. He, just, he didn't just copy one of them and make that into the Textus Receptus. He examined them all and then even had, had to get access to the Latin Vulgate and uh, back translate the, the Latin Vulgate into Greek to fill in the gaps of the Greek manuscripts that he had, to fill, fill in the gaps there. And so... That's the origin of the Textus Receptus, uh, which was very much uh, the, the text used for the translation of the King James Version of the Bible. And so um, you have this kind of thing where um, no matter what side of the argument you're on, you must engage in some measure of textual criticism. Uh, it's inescapable. So the question becomes, well, what are the rules by which we're guided? Do we just kind of uh, implicitly know what the right text is going to be? No. Do we just assume that the early church fathers knew what the right text would be? No. Uh, do we just accept it? Or do we think critically about how uh, that text came to us? What are its weaknesses and strengths uh, what are its connections with other texts? And how do we evaluate the authority of any one particular text on a, a reading? And um, I'll just repeat this one more thing. And, and then we, we are actually going to get into the book here. Um, I'm trying to bring up some of our folks online uh, in, into their uh, background here. But... Um, oh, we're reminded that there's about 85% of the New Testament text, which all of the Greek manuscripts have in common. There's no variant readings among them at all. So the vast majority of the New Testament, there's no question with regard to what the reading is. Then say there's 12, 15%, I'm not sure of the percentage there, where there is some question with regard to what is the exact reading there. But in 
the great majority of those variant readings, none of them make any difference in terms of the meaning of the text. Uh, they don't add anything to the text, like what we were saying a moment ago about Philippians 4, verse 13, whether it's, I can do all things through him who strengthens me, or all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's the same thing, just different words for saying the same thing. And so the vast majority of the variant readings make no difference in the overall meaning of the text. They're just different ways of saying the same thing for the most part. Where there are uh, significant differences with different meanings attached, none of those differences affect the message of the gospel, the theology of, of the scriptures, uh, the uh, ethics that the scriptures uh, uh, call us to. Uh, none of that is affected by it all. We have all that we need for life and godliness in th these texts of scripture, and none of that is affected by the variant readings. So we can have full confidence that we have the essential purity of the original text for us. All that we need for life and godliness is there. Whether you're following the traditional text or the expanded modern critical text, which includes, for example, the Codex Sinaiticus, uh, the Codex Vaticanus, a uh, text that uh, the uh, King James only folks like to jump on and uh, criticize. Uh, even if you're, you're including all that, uh, in the end, you have to have certain critical uh, methods to evaluate which reading is the more authoritative. And so that gets us into uh, textual criticism. It can be done from the perspective of the godly uh, Christian who wants to know, has a reverence for the authority of Scripture and wishes to know what the original text of Scripture actually says. And so we shouldn't be afraid of the idea of textual criticism. Now, let's get into Dr. Skelton for a bit. We're on page 170 of the book, and he's going to refer to Dr. C. Wister Hodge and a book that he has written, uh, or excuse me, a, a, an article that he's written in the Princeton Theological Review back in 1913, and we'll see what he has to say about that. Um, so let's get started. <clears throat> it should be evident also that we cannot remove the necessity for textual criticism through an appeal to the inward testimony of the Holy Spirit. Now, I should say that previously we considered uh, whether uh, God's providence eliminates the need for textual criticism, whether the fact that God and his providence has brought about a majority text and that's been largely in use by the Christian church over the centuries, whether that providence is an indication that um, we are following the word of God there. And we saw that uh, the providence of God is not necessarily an indicator that one particular line of texts is faithful to the original text, whereas others are not. And we kind of made the point to that end, that uh, God's providence is not only seen in the majority texts that come down to us, but also in the obscure texts that have been preserved in various locations and over periods of time, which we can now take a look at and get even further back into uh, the history of the New Testament. So we can go all the way back, closer and closer in time to when the original texts were written. And presumably, as we as we get closer in time to the original text, we get closer to a point that is freer of the additional mistakes that copies can, can bring to the original text. So this makes sense, doesn't it? The closer I get to the original text, the more likely it is that I have a faithful reproduction of that text as opposed to something that's centuries later where you have plenty of time for additional errors to take place in the life history of that text. And so uh, the, the older the manuscript, the closer it is to the original text of Scripture, the more likely it is that it has fewer mistakes and is more accurate. 
Now, we can explain the fact that uh, the church and, and, his, and God's providence followed one particular line of text and not perhaps some of these older texts uh, in view of the fact that some of these older texts were, if you will, out of use and perhaps simply uh, used for translation purposes in different languages and were not part of the original or the regular use of the church because they didn't speak Greek. The Greek texts predominate in the life history of the church because the Christians spoke Greek. That was the world language of the day. But if you were speaking Latin or uh, one of the African languages or uh, uh, you know, later on uh, French, Italian, Spanish, what have you, you would not be reading from the Greek text, you'd be reading from the translations. And so the original Greek text that was foundational to those translations would not be quite so plentiful because it's reproduced in the translations that follow it. So that might be one reason why you don't have um, a great variety of these other older texts uh, in God's providence. But we shouldn't prejudice those texts because others are uh, copied and uh, more predominant. So now we consider the consider, consider the idea of the inward testimony of the Holy Spirit. Does the inward testimony of the Spirit in the life of the believer uh, lead him to discern between a true reading and a text of Scripture as opposed to a false reading in a text of Scripture? So we'll look at that. He says, uh, uh, continuing on, the witness of the Holy Spirit to the Bible does not involve the direct communication of facts. So the Spirit's not communicating new truth to you. He's not uh, identifying certain things for you in, in that kind of way. He goes on, as Dr. C. Wister Hodge has said, the witness of the Holy Spirit to the Word, quote, is not the mystical communication of a truth, nor the causing to emerge in consciousness of a blind and unfounded faith. Hence, it does not witness to questions which are to be determined by exegetical and historical considerations. So the inward testimony of the Spirit does not excuse us from the responsibility of intelligently evaluating the text of Scripture that we have before us. It's not just some inner impulse that we have that, ah, yes, this is the, the correct reading, and that's the incorrect reading, and so therefore I follow that. Why? Because that's what appeals to me. Well, how do you know that that's what the Holy Spirit is saying within you, and it's not what your heart wants it to say? You have a, a desire for uh, eloquence in the translation of the Scriptures, but sometimes the Scriptures may be rather plain and direct, uh, not very eloquent and high-sounding. Well, your expectation of eloquence in Scripture may go against what is actually there. And so you, you may be guided more by your inner truth than by the inward testimony of the Holy Spirit. Um, Dr. Skelton says, we must look for such grounds for the acceptance or rejection of variant readings as God has provided and seek to glorify him by arriving at the truth in the manner which he has made available to us. By the grace of God, we may recognize the validity of the claims of certain readings and may make right decisions. We may receive benefits from the working of the Holy Spirit in us. But we ought not to expect that the necessity for consecrated scientific investigation will be removed. I'll, I'll make a comparison here between uh, the intelligent evaluation of the, the text of Scripture with the uh, theological, uh, scientific, intelligent reaction to the doctrines of Scripture. We don't just depend on the Holy Spirit to produce a, a work of systematic theology. Uh, we, we seek the Spirit's guidance and so forth, but we have to think through issues of theology. 
And so we've got to think through issues of the Trinity and how the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit relate to each other and how Jesus was incarnate of the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary. There's theological reflection that is required of us, and we have to think through these things, work logically through uh, the statements of Scripture, uh, pull things together and understand what Scripture says. That takes study, analysis, thoughtful evaluation of the Scriptures. Why is it acceptable for us to have this kind of evaluation of the doctrines of Scripture, but not over the text of Scripture? Um, the internal testimony of the Spirit is not designed to be kind of a litmus test as to which variant reading is the more accurate reading of the next. It tells us, it affirms, that the Scriptures are the Word of God, and that we are the child of God by the work of regeneration. And it affirms these things to us. Uh, and as Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life. The word of Christ is given to us in scriptures. And we have that essentially in its purity in all of scripture, whatever text that you're making use of. But in terms of these little variant readings, um, God requires us to think through these things and to have a scientific investigation. Scientific. And just like a, a scientist has to go through school, med school to become a, a doctor or a surgeon or what have you, um, a, a computer expert needs to study computer science and so forth. A politician needs to study political science. There are uh, disciplines that we need to undergo in order to understand God's world more accurately. Uh, top of verse, uh, page 171. We will, furthermore, not find any infallible solution to textual problems in the deliverances of popes and church councils. Popes. Now, um, bear in mind that the King James only uh, approach looks on uh, the decision of King James to have a translation uh, published and a, a collection of scholars came together to put that into effect. That's in effect a kind of church council uh, that uh, translated and then endorsed that particular translation. So bear that in the background here as we talk about uh, popes and church councils. The scriptures do not confer on popes infallibility in determining textual questions. And they certainly do not promise to any men or councils inerrancy in decisions regarding the text. So uh, the Roman Catholics like to think that the pope, when he speaks ex cathedra, has an infallible statement, kind of a revelation from God that the church must abide by. We're going to see that that doesn't always work out too well as we get into particularly the textual issues here. Um, again, nowhere in the New Testament, nowhere in the Old Testament are we told that copyists or translators will be able to exercise their discipline under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit with an inerrant copy or translation for the church. Nowhere in scriptures do we read that kind of authorization coming to the church. God does say that he will preserve his word. It is kept pure in heaven. But the earthly copies do have mistakes. They're variant readings in them all. That's interesting. I guess if those copyists were inspired and inerrant, there would be no variant readings whatsoever. They would be exactly identical from one to the next, generation to generation for millennia. And that's simply not the case. Um, the it's Church of Rome has had some unenviable experiences with papal ventures in the sphere of textual criticism. Pope Sixtus V, Sixtus VI, fifth, <laughs> you got confused there. Pope Sixtus V in 1590 published an edition of the Latin Vulgate with a revised text, which he sought to make authoritative. He prefaced his edition with a, a bull in which he declared, now a bull was an official 
papal statement, a doctrinal declaration that everybody had to abide by within the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, don't think about the animal here. Think about um, the, this bulletin, if you will, from uh, the Pope. Uh, and incidentally, he revised the Latin Vulgate, so he's already engaged in correcting what has come down to him in the previous translations uh, in earlier periods of time. So he's updating the language and then putting his imprimatur on this revised text. So he says, in this our perpetually valid constitution, uh, which is the, the Latin Vulgate, I think is what he's referring to, we resolve and declare from our certain knowledge and from the plenitude of, the, of apostolical authority, the Pope and the apostolic witness through the, the church, that that Vulgate Latin edition of the sacred page of the Old and New Testament which was received as authentic by the Council of Trent, is without any doubt or controversy to be reckoned that very one which we now publish, corrected as best may be, and printed in the printing office of the Vatican, to be read in the Universal Republic of Christendom and in all the churches of the Christian world, decreeing that it, approved as it is, first by the universal consent of the Holy Church and of the Holy Fathers, then by the decree of the General Council of Trent, and now also by the apostolical authority delivered to us by the Lord, is to be received and held as true, legitimate, authentic, and undoubted in all public and private controversies, readings, preachings, and expositions. Um, so, uh, Pope Sixtus V uh, argues that this updated revision of the Latin Vulgate that was approved by the Council of Trent, which occurred, I think, in the 1560s or so, uh, this updated version, which has been corrected and so forth, is authoritative for, the, for, the, for all of Christendom and is not to be questioned. It's undoubted. It's effectively saying that the Latin Vulgate is an inspired, inerrant text translation. Now, if the Pope was correct, why is there a need for an inspired translation in English in the form of the King James Bible? Why don't we just simply learn the Latin Vulgate because that's the language that has God's imprimatur in terms of the apostolic succession of the popes and uh, the Council of Trent and all these kinds of things. Well. I don't think the King James only people would be too thrilled to accept the Latin Vulgate. But you can see the parallel parallel path that the, the Roman Catholic Church was on with that of the King James only movement, in which a, a certain group of people identify a text as authoritative, inspired, inerrant word of God, and nothing further is to be added to it or taken away. And so... Uh, here's what happened to that particular version of the Latin Vulgate promulgated by Sixtus V with his apostolic authority, uh, presumably by revelation of God, uh, an infallible uh, text. Um, we read, Variant readings, according to Sixtus's proscription, were not to be printed in the margin in subsequent editions and the edition then issued was not to be modified. The major excommunication was to be visited upon violators, and absolution was to be received from the Pope alone. So in terms of this new copy of the Latin Vulgate, no variant readings were allowed. Because why, why have a variant reading if you have the inspired and errant text of Scripture, right? Compare that to right, the right. King James only point of view, and the fact that the original 1611 King James translation had a wide variety of variant readings in its margins. Good thing there wasn't a, a pope uh, excommunicating anyone who would add a variant reading in the margin of the King James Bible. In any case, uh, uh, Skilton continues, Sixtus V died soon after the appearance of his edition of the Vulgate. Interesting. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, he kind of messes with the word of God and he's not long for this life. And his authoritative addition came on evil days. As early as September 5th, 1590, that's the same year in which the, the translation was published, the same year, just later on in the fall. Uh, September 5th, according to Dr. Steinmuller, who himself is a Roman Catholic, a Roman Catholic writer, according to Steinmuller, the sale of Sixtus's Bible was forbidden and the available copies were destroyed. So we're not talking about just putting a, a variant reading in the margin here. The whole thing was wiped out and all the copies collected and destroyed. Pope Gregory XIV in 1591 appointed a commission to revise the Sistine Vulgate and the principles supported by the revision committee were quite drastic. So one more revision. We got to Work it over one more time. Sixtus V di just didn't get it right. And so the whole thing needs to be scrapped. Well, where was that apostolic authority coming through the Pope there? And the, the support of the Council of Trent and so forth. Where was this notion of it being undoubted in terms of its use in public controversies, preachings, so forth? Uh Skelton continues, the revision was completed on June 23rd, 1591, one year later, and in 1592, <coughs> Clement VIII, who had become Pope in that year, gave his approval to the work of Gregory's commission, and the newly revised text was published under the name of the late Sixtus V. This edition, which differed from the Sistine Vulgate, and some few thousand readings, Sistine Vulgate referring, I think, to uh, the Latin Vulgate promulgated by Sixtus V uh, and reflected in the um, Council of Trent's uh, approval. This Sistine, this edition of the Sistine Vulgate uh, had some thousands of uh, revisions. Uh, wow, no. This edition, which differed from the Sistine Vulgate in some thousand readings, was supported by a bull, a bulletin, uh, cum sacrorum. Although it was admitted in the preface that the new edition was not perfect, hear that King James only, folks, uh, any changes in it or marginal insertions of variant readings were forbidden by the bull. The effect of this bull was to hinder for centuries, the advance of textual criticism of the Vulgate in the Church of Rome. At long last in our day, a critical edition of the Vulgate is being provided under church auspices. So, um, we see here a, an example in church history of how uh, a, a determination by the Pope or a church council or something like that does not make one particular translation into the inspired inerrant translation that all English-speaking people or others need to follow. That is to place in the authority of men the ability to determine what is the infallible word of God, and we don't have that kind of authority granted to us in Scripture. Uh, we don't become infallible uh, in, in any way. Any preacher preaching from the pulpit is not infallible in what he has to say. He's not inerrant. I am not certainly inerrant. Um, so uh, we don't have that authority entrusted to us, even though we are preaching the word of God. Um, okay, I want to finish this idea as we're getting towards the end of our time here. Um, he continues, it appears then that we cannot rightly expect providence to place the best possible text of the scriptures in our hands or the Holy Spirit to communicate to us information as to which readings are correct or some ecclesiastical authority to settle infallibly for us questions of text. We must engage in consecrated scientific labor, the method of God's appointment for us. I guess I don't want to do that. Uh, I think I'll, I think I'll finish there for today, and we'll pick it up next time. 
So we're on page 173 at the bottom. We're midway through the page. And uh, I'll finish here and give you an opportunity to comment, uh, but we're going to close the video online and thank those folks who are visiting. I uh, hope that you will join us uh, from week to week at First Presbyterian Church if you have that opportunity in Percocy, Pennsylvania. God bless. <laughs>